Welcome to the MSME Radio Network, a division of the Multiple Sclerosis Global Support Network. The following program broadcast is an original creation by the broadcast entity. Discussion within the following broadcast should be used for informational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional medical advice or consultation. Before considering application of any broadcast content in the following program, please consult your health care provider. If you feel you are having a medical emergency, please contact your local health services for immediate assistance. MSME Media and the Multiple Sclerosis Global Support Network do not guarantee or warrant the accuracy of information in the broadcast to follow. The Multiple Sclerosis Global Support Network provisions broadcast services to program host. Information discussed in the broadcast does not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or goals of the network and are solely those of the show broadcast host. Should you wish to host a broadcast, please visit our website at msmemedia.com and submit a request to become a program host. We thank you for listening to the MSME Radio Network. Enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. This is MS Frontiers Radio, and I'm your host, Dulcie Hill. MS Frontiers is a peer resource group meant to serve each other through our own experiences dealing with multiple sclerosis, medically, symptomatically, emotionally, socially, dietetically, physically, and specifically through our programs on uh, exclusive uh, uh, Facebook support group for primary progressive and secondary progressive diseases. Our resources uh, can be found at msfrontiers.org and I invite you all to go there. Now, let me tell you a little about, a bit about me. Multiple sclerosis has been part of my life since 1984. I was officially diagnosed in 93. In 1990, I had uh, an attack of optic neuritis and that was my first treatment. They didn't even know if I had MS, so what they did is they offered me a study program of being hospitalized and inject it with steroids. I believe it was every six hours. And um, it may or may not restore my sight. Well, I did the study. I went in, I got that it did restore my sight. And uh, um, that was that for them. Uh, what happened next is that uh, uh, in 1993, I had gone to a neur- neurology, or excuse me, I went to a general practitioner appointment I had something wrong with my foot and the general practitioner asked me if there was anything else that could be wrong and I said well I've got this uh, uh, numb patch on my skin and and, uh, it's actually parathesia now that I understand it now that I know but at the time I thought it was well it was called the skin bruise that's what my mom said and that it was growing pains and everybody had it. The problem was is I was 24 and uh, the, the general practitioner was looking at me saying people don't have that and I said well maybe it's a pinched nerve well she immediately sent me to a neurologist who confirmed it was MS with the spinal tap and an MRI I went to University of Pennsylvania and I got a second opinion in classic textbook uh, multiple sclerosis they said so once I was diagnosed, I went on beta serum, which had been approved within a month of my diagnosis. There, there was a lottery back then for uh, uh, people to get on it because it was so in demand. But since I was an Air Force wife um, and there were so few people uh, with MS in the Air Force, I was lucky enough, I was fortunate enough to be able to get on it right away. What I was unfortunate to have happened to me is that the the symptoms, the side effects of beta serum was so terrible for me, the flu-like side effects, that I could not tolerate the medication. All right, so I wasn't on that. Then what was my choices? Well, my mom found a COP, copolymer 1 study, COP1, which led to the FDA approval of Copaxone. Well, I went into that phase three study and I was on it. And fortunately, because I was in it, when it got approved, I was able to continue to stay on it for the next 10 years. 
um, while I was on Copaxone, I moved to Seattle and I was told by my neurologist at the time that he felt my disease was unstable and that I needed to be on Avonex. Well, since Avonex was an interferon and I hated beta seron, um, I was nervous, but I, I took his advice and I, I went on it and I was on both Copaxone and beta seron for, for probably four more years in which I stopped taking the Copaxone altogether and I was solely on Avonex. Well, within the next uh, a few years, my disease became active again and uh, I moved to Southern California and uh, um, emailed my, my Seattle neurologist who said that uh, I should consider Novantrim. At the time I was being uh, uh, studied at, uh, uh, or I was being treated at University of Southern California. So uh, they put me on Novantrim and entered me into the Tisabri uh, study program there, where I was on Tisabri. Well, I was on, actually, I wasn't on Tisabri. I was on the placebo and Avonex at the same time. That's when somebody developed PML and everybody got pulled off that study. Um, fortunately, that uh, I went off Avonex and it was, I moved to Maryland and I was going to, uh, um, University of Pennsylvania, where they decided that it would be in my best interest to do to Sabri. I loved to Sabri. I went on it. I stopped Avonex, went on to Sabri, and and it worked for gosh, like uh, seven years. I was on it, but my risk of PML was so high because they discovered tests that you can take to determine your risk of PML. Um, and I, I had all factors making it to, I was on it for so long and then to Sabri and I had the JCB virus, uh, um, Richter, so they took me off that. I went on Jelenia for a while and then, uh, finally Rituxin. Over the years, I've studied neurology and multiple sclerosis to the point of being able to dictate my personal treatment of my disease. I dictate my test and my doctor's visit. I made a lot of mistakes as well. I've been a victim of other mistakes because of my lack of knowledge. Well, I discovered all of my mistakes, all of the lack of knowledge, and I discovered treating MS involves a daily commitment of my continuing education, analysis, and questioning, and consulting with experts and neurologists in the field. Uh, I test my theories. I've learned so much that's helped me. I'm duty bound to share what I know to my brothers and sisters with MS. I felt called by God to deliver messages free of commercial on my YouTube channel. Uh, just look up Dulce Hill on YouTube and I'm all over the place there. And I started medical support groups called MS Frontiers on Facebook. Um, over the years that this ministry has grown so much that, uh, that it's taken on a life of its own and other people serve each other uh, with their experience and I, I'm just a, uh, a vessel of God's great work that we can do for each other. All right, that's enough of me. Um, this week's topic is responsible treatment of multiple sclerosis. Now, in 2013, the disease of multiple sclerosis was distinguished further into two groups for the purpose of determining if medications will be effective as a treatment choice. This is huge. Knowing that in 2013, we, we now know if medications will work. Um, customarily, the old theory was that uh, neurologists would put us on medications in case it actually protected in a way that could not be, term be determined. So uh, when in doubt, medicate. That was, that was the old theory because they couldn't tell when your disease was going to pop up. This new designation allowed MS to be treated when medication can be affected and not to be treated when these expensive medications administered 
are being administered. I mean, the co-pays alone, you know, when it takes up that doesn't work, and the exposure to medication risks are just unnecessary. So we don't want to do that. This is also important because many doctors are prescribing these new medication using the old philosophy that taking something is better than taking nothing, which can be dangerous, especially in the case of Ocrevez and the increased risk of breast cancer. That, that just, it's, it's irresponsible. What are the two distinctions that I'm talking about that uh, they discovered in 2000? Uh, 13 that separate MS into treatable versus untreatable groups. These two divisions are known as active multiple sclerosis and inactive multiple sclerosis. Designations of active MS is exactly as it sounds. All those with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis have activity. They also have uh, uh, that, that activity is revealed in the name relapsing multiple sclerosis. Relapsing means attacks. Um, attacks also known as exacerbations. If your disease comes with attacks in your MS, then you have active MS. These attacks can easily be seen on MRIs. But here is what is most interesting. Secondary progressive and primary progressive multiple sclerosis can be active too. This means that even though the person with the progressing MS is slowly getting worse, new damaging attacks can add new symptoms to an already difficult situation. Active MS is consistent with inflammation as a result of these attacks. All right, so now that we know, we know we have active MS when there is activity. Uh, an example of this is that uh, I have secondary progressive MS. They took me off Jelenia uh, for eight months there, and, and it, there's a reason. I had low lymphocytes, so they were waiting to, for my lymphocytes, my bone marrow, to build my lymphocytes back up so I could uh, take rituximab and kill off the B, uh, B20 uh, uh, proteins off uh, the B cells, uh, CD20 uh, proteins that are, uh, are related to MS exacerbations. Well, what happened is when I was off Jelenia that long and my lymphocytes never came back for fear that, uh, and I couldn't take both at the same time for fear of serious infection, I had a catastrophic attack, my, proving that my MS was extremely active and aggressive there. So what does that mean? That meant that they had to put so much steroids on me and put me on this rituximab even though my risk of infection was bad just to stop the disease because my disease was so active. Treatment of active MS in order of effectiveness here. This is relapsing remitting and any active uh, um, secondary progressive or, or primary pro progressive in the order of effectiveness. This is uh, established by the MS Society. Copaxone is 29% effective. Albego, Albegio, I can't say that, 31% effective. Avonex is 33% effective. So is Rebif. Beta Serum is 34%. Pelegrity is 36%. Zimbrita is 45%. Tectifera is 49%. Gelenia is 54%. Limtrada is 55% effective. Navantrone is 66% effective, but the side effects of Navantrone um, makes it only a, a viable option for, for infusions. It, it, can, it can hurt your heart. Tisabri is 68%. I love that. Plus, it, it has the chances of making you feel just a little better, too. Rituxib Rituxan and Ocrevez have various levels of effectiveness depending on who did the study.
you know there's the, when the drug company did the study uh, it, it, they had less, uh, more effectiveness and less side effects. Independent studies showed the opposite, showed less effectiveness and more side effects, except in Rituxan, where they showed it very safe. It was an 11-year study of people who took it for rheumatoid arthritis. They found it safe. Nobody had any long-term effect. This is why it's imperative to have a MRI, MRI every six months to a year if you know you have had attacks um, or exacerbations. You want to determine if these, if you have new lesions and that the medication you've been on is working. All right, so now we know the type of MS that, uh, that medications work for. Medications work for active MS. The other type of MS that medications do not work for is non-active MS and it has far less inflammation than inactive MS. This is when the disease is in remission and can be verified by an MRI showing no new lesions from year to year. If you have no new lesions then, and, then you don't have uh, active MS. This is a classic course of secondary progressive MS in that there are no new symptoms, but we secondary progressive people feel like we're getting worse. The same is true with primary progressive MS in that progression cannot be stopped. These disease modification, modifying medications cannot make us feel, cannot make us feel better. Um, once we're in the progressive phase because it does nothing to slow progression. It can only stop active attacks. It doesn't slow progression. Now the good news is the only thing that, that uh, we can do is uh, we can make uh, uh, symptom management, better symptom management choices with medication and we can make lifestyle adjustments, including diet and exercise and, and just attitude adjustments. Uh, uh, the MS Society came up with that uh, wonderful uh, uh, phrase about uh, uh, resilience. Resilience is the ability to adapt um, and make, the, make new plans on when things happen. Um, for instance, when I stopped being able to do the elliptical trainer at the gym, I took up swimming and I had to be trained how to do that by the swim coach. And, and now I do the crawl and, you know, the, the freestyle, I do that uh, and I limit it to 30 laps a day and it's cool. The water is cool and, and uh, it just, I get energy, I feel like I'm flying, you know, when I'm doing that because I, it's my form of walking. So uh, there are other things, there's chair tai chi, there's all sorts of exercises that I point out, different levels on, on that YouTube channel or in MS Frontiers exercise, rehab and therapy. All right, so how can inactive MS be treated? It can't with any disease modifying medication. What specifically won't work? Solumedrol, sol, solumedrol won't work. Ocrevez, Rituxan, none of that stuff. Copaxone, uh, Revif, Desabri, Lemtrada, none of that stuff will work if you have an inactive disease. So taking these medications puts, at, puts, puts us at an unnecessary seri risk for short-term and long-term side effects, like breast cancer and ocrevets. So if you have inactive disease, uh, if you have that inactive and you have family history of breast cancer, don't take ocrevets. Bring that and, and, you know, don't take my word. Um, listen to this over and over and take notes and bring it to your doctor. And, and you demand that doctor explain his decision. Um, it's, it's really disturbing when doctors are describing these meds to, to do something rather than nothing when the, this effectiveness can be determined. Um, this is old school. They're, they're treating us old school instead of based on what we know from 2013. 
um, yeah, I, 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 I want to uh, tell you so much more, but I think it was in confidence between uh, 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 Johns Hopkins and me, so I can't, can't uh, do that. All I know is that you have to be very careful. There's a sinister thing going on, and, and the wholesale media reporting that everybody with uh, uh, secondary or, or with progressive MS should be on Ocrevez when Ocrevez is made by Rituxin, the same company. Um, it is it is made by Genetech, who owns both both uh, patents. Rituxin wasn't studied for MS because the patent expired, and now Rituxin can be made generic. So if uh, if Genetech. Uh, prove that rituximab is as effective as Ocrevez, therefore MS, they're, they're, they, they're given uh, a license to any generic. They can't make money on their, their exclusive medication. So there's a, a sinister quality about this there, that they only put forth the test for Ocrevez and not rituximab. So that's important to know. Um, follow the money. Uh, what can we do as patients with MS when we consider our treatments? First, we have to consult with our neurologist to help us determine whether we have active or inactive MS. We can ask if our MRI shows new activity. Um, we can ask the doctor to, to, de to determine the course of our disease and, and what it's taken. We can ask the doctor um, what course of, see I just got that all mixed up. We can ask the doctor to determine the course of our disease and, and what, what it's taking, what course is it taking based on our history of attacks. It just, you know, if we're having less and less attacks as things are, as time's going on, what does that suggest? People with non-active MS are being put on these medications in hopes that they will feel better. Just like taking an aspirin won't make you feel better if you don't have a headache. So we must be careful with, our, with what we expose our body to. We have to be extremely careful of what these doctors are willing to expose our, our body to. I'm a big drug pro proponent and believe, doing every, believe in doing everything possible to stay healthy. I've been quick to jump on drugs when in doubt, but knowing this knowing that there's a distinction between active MS and, and inactive MS and, and knowing that distinction allows us to know if a treatment will be effective, it changes everything in treating MS. All right, so now let me go on. I, I did this video and I had a couple people post uh, questions or suggestions or whatever, and I posted this all over MS Frontiers Medical Support there, and I got feedback there. So this is, Kay had uh, written to me um, on as a result, result of the, uh, she watching the video. She says, thank you, Dulcie. I wish I, I wish I knew which MS category I was. I have not had new lesions for the past seven years, maybe more. I just pushed the symptoms since 1997 with casual neurologist appointments. I had some MRIs, but never got too committed in facing my condition. I think I was in denial. Now I have a neurologist who's an MS specialist, and now I'm committed to learning and doing more. Maybe a day late and a dollar short, but I'm trying anyway. My MS condition has slowly gotten worse over time. And the last few years, the worsening has sped up. So what I, I responded is the worsening symptoms are consistent with the secondary stage of multiple sclerosis. There's nothing to stop that, only symptom management, drugs, and exercise. Active versus inactive MS has only been recognized classification since 2013. Your sounds like inactive secondary progressive MS, but only your doctor is the one who can officially determine this. It's never too late to own your own disease. 
So again, um, some of these questions I'm having are the same ones over and over. So I've done many videos, I've, or two videos, I've, uh, and tons of posts saying the same thing over and over and over again um, in hopes that, that it'll be easily understood. Um, so what I want to say is then, then there is a gal, Debbie. She chimed in. She says, and she's got primary progressive MS. She says, the huge problem here is that only about 15% have primary progressive MS. And of that small subset of people, only a very few will ever show active lesions. So very few is going to have active MS or uh, primary progressive. She says, it seems quite odd that the FDA would approve Ocrevez for that, only that small of a number of patients. And I agree. I, I agree. I mean, I just don't know how they did it. But, And then there's a gal named Teresa that says, what happens if you have a relapse with no lesions? And my answer was uh, almost impossible. Only 5% don't show don't, only 5% of attacks don't show up as lesions. It's more likely to have a lesion that shows up but doesn't cause symptoms. Finally, I want to leave you with our website again and a parting prayer. Our website, website is msfrontiers.org and the prayer comes from a wonderful prayer found in a 12-step uh, program, the, a national 12-step program. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them can bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, thy way of life. May I do thy will always. And uh, that's, that's about it right there. With that, I want to also tell you that uh, our ministry is based on 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 12, 8 through 10, where Paul pleads with the Lord to take away his affliction. But the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul proclaimed that he delight in weakness and insults and hardship and persecution and difficulties. For when he was weak, then he was strong. And that's kind of uh, everybody who volunteers with MS Frontiers uh, serves serves others with MS through the Lord with that. We use our affliction uh, for, for helping others. So uh, um, thank you so much for listening. And again, uh, uh, we've got big plans with this MS radio. we got MS and me radio. And uh, um, hopefully we'll be able to talk to you about diet, nutrition, and exercise. But right now, this is, this is about treatment until we get a hold of that. Thank you. God bless you. And tune in next week.